Jim Crockett Promotions from, well, 1985 and 1990s, very really respectfully. So let's jump right into it with Jim Crockett Promotions. Actually, episode 46. I didn't know which episode I started off with on a network last week, but it, apparently 45 was the first one you could find on a network. So this is episode 46 from November 16th, 1985. The show opens with clips of Nikita Koloff beating up some anorexic ginger. Now, this man is scrawny, he's got red hair. That's all we know about him. Never learned his name, which will make it even more impressive because he has a match later on the actual show. Uh, Nikita hits a Russian sickle, and the ginger almost takes a flip bump from it. Sort of lands on his, like, almost head. The shot freezes on the guy laid out. Tony Schiavone and David Crockett welcome us to the actual show. And the Russians walk up, speaking, speaking of Nikita. Uh, they walk up as Tony and David are in the middle of running down tonight's card. Nikita said the Road Warriors are finally got the guts to be in the building tonight. Said that he's, see, he said that he heard Animal's the strongest man, but he's just a little stronger than Animal. He said, maybe Animal, you sometimes feel like a sickle. Don't really know what that meant. Ivan said rock and roll inside a steel cage. It's arcade. They got pl no place to go. The Russians, they don't believe in Christmas or Thanksgiving, but they did give them a present. Because, you know, all those presents you get at Thanksgiving. It was some book. I couldn't see what the book really said, but it looked like a German title. Crusher said nothing, and they left. It was uh, Ivan cut a fine promo, Nikita... Kita's never been a great promo, but he got his words out. And Crusher said nothing, which is probably good. The opening match has Tony Zane taking on already one of my favorites on this series, Jimmy Valiant, the Boogie Woogie Man. Jimmy starts off by just dancing and high-fiving with the fans. He runs up to Tony and David. He says something, but I can't hear what he says because he rambles like a fucking madman. And he, the music's still playing. He gets in a ring, locks up before the bell even rings. He rakes Tony's eyes. He pulls Tony down by the hair, and he hits Tony in the throat with his thumb. Yes, Jimmy is a face. Jimmy quickly wins with an elbow drop. Just to let you know what these 1986 jobbers look like, Tony was fat and generic looking. But Jimmy Jam Valiant, he was fat? But not like Tony Fab, where Tony would just look disgusting. Jimmy was fat, but he didn't look horrible. And Jimmy was ve very far from generic. Jimmy's fucking insane, as we'll see of a promo from him later on in the show. Jim Crockett is there with Tony Schiavone. Said Jimmy, whatever sense he had left, whatever little sense he had left, he lost it picking a woman to be his tag partner in the Atlantic Street fight. It will be the Midnight Express versus Jimmy Valiant and Miss Elena Lively with a big mama in their corner in an Atlantic Street fight. Both teams threatened to rip each other's clothes off and expose the other team naked. Jim Cornette called uh, both Miss Elena Lively and Big Mama fat cows, you know, a different time. And then he said the Midnight Express can beat up any, no, he can beat any woman's brains out. That's nice, I guess. And that's, you know, different time. We go back to the ring for our second act match as Billy Jack Haynes takes on Gerald Finlay. And I think last week, out of any of the actual stars, not including the jobbers on NWA, I was least impressed with Billy Jack Haynes. Not physically, he's fucking huge, but uh, just in the ring, he would do like a move and then just go back to rest holds. It got very boring very quickly, and he gave him one of the longest matches. The match started off as a handshake. So far, Gerald's the only one who actually, of the jobbers I've seen who actually looks like he's in good shape. That would change later in the show. Uh, Billy with a few strikes. Gerald tries to strike back, but it has no effect on big barrel chested Billy Jack Haynes. Uh, he goes straight to a bear hug. David Crockett says, he is some man, all dreamily. His arms are monstrous. Look at that. Look at him said David Crockett, all dreamily. A suplex and a backbreaker for two. The bell ringer got confused and rang the bell, and the referee had to look at him and go, no, saying, not the fuck, it's not over. A gorilla press and a full Nelson for the win. Not as many rest holds by Billy Jack, but uh, still nothing really exciting. 
The most exciting part of his matches are hearing how David Crockett will drool all over him. But we go back to the ring for Larry Clark versus Crusher Khrushchev. Crusher chokes Larry on the top rope. Larry has a body of a skinny, fat, 40-year-old dad. Like he's not obese, but if he takes off his shirt, there will be jiggling. He looks like he just came from a barbecue. Nick Crusher froze Larry down with a pretty nice body slam. Neck snapped. Oh, yeah, so he froze Larry outside of the ring. Larry gets back on the apron. And they did the neck the neck uh, snap spot. And I've always seen it like a guy sell it by falling backwards. But, whew, sorry. But uh, they use a neck, the neck snap spot to bring Larry back into the ring. Could look kind of awkward. Crusher has got Larry in some rest holds. And we found out why Crusher really didn't do much talking as he tried to trash talk and in his unintimidating voice. And yeah, that's a lot of talk of it for me. He said, bring him on. Bring him on. He hits the Russian sickle to win two. It was a boring match. Uh, not really much to go on. A lot of these uh, squash matches aren't very exciting. It's the stars that bring the attention to the matches. And Crusher, unfortunately, wasn't the biggest star. The most entertaining part of this was his unintimidating trash talk. It's also weird that in this group of Ivan, Crusher, and Nikita, two men have the exact same finisher as both Crusher and Nikita due to Russian sickle for a finish. That'd be like in uh, the fucking Undisputed Era if Adam Cole had the same finish as Kyle O'Reilly, and, like, they just both did it. Shivani's at the podium was Ron Bass. Long time ago, he had a problem with a lot of people, but then a man came to him. That man was Dusty. Dusty said, I heard you got a problem with a lot of people, did it? Let me tell you about this mess. So imagine you take a bull rope, and you tie it to your arm, and then you tie it to the other man's arm, and there's a big old Kyle Bell. Ron Bass said, if you've never been hit with a rope against your skin, the rip, the tearing, it hurts. And it hurts like hell, and it hurts for a long time. And then you take the 10-pound bell, and the edges can cut you like a knife, and the 10 pounds can come on your skull like a sledgehammer. He said, the cowboy is ready. Not a bad promo from Ron Bass. Sadly, that wouldn't be the last time we saw him in the ring ton or tonight. But a, but a pretty good promo from a Mr. Ron. <laughs> but it was about to be outdone by the best promos imaginable. Tony Schiavone is at the podium with Jimmy Valiant. Now, if the thumbnail loads right, Jimmy Valiant will be just staring at you with a death stare of insanity. And uh, that's the picture from the, this promo. He has some sort of weird long scarf on which matches his tights. And he also has a hat, a Harley Davidson hat. He says he's been to Mars, he's been to Jupiter, he's been to Pluto, and Saturn. But only been at the Big Dipper for about five or six minutes with two of his ladies. I guess he's saying that he can only last five or six minutes, but look into that eye of those thumbnails and tell me any different. He said Cornette will be busier than a one-eyed one man at a peep show in that street fight. He said Cornette is a Silver Spoon Mama's boy. Eight years old, Jimmy was in gangs. He can take a street fight. He threatened to not only make the Rock and Roll Express naked, but to also rip off Jim Cornette's clothes. And you know what? I love Jimmy Valiant. I, <laughs> he's insane. He does only heel moves in his matches, but the crowd loves him. And his promos, I, I don't like pausing. Well, I'll to take notes while doing this, but I will rewatch Jimmy Valiant's promos because he 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 has a way with words. Sadly, Ron Bass is back after his pretty good promo, as he takes on some guy named Paul Garner. Garner has no body; he's scrawny, but he has like sort of a flabby chest where it has no definition to it. Uh, Ron caught a big boot attempt and hit a punch. Garner tries these ugly shoulder tackles in the rope, not even in the corner. Ron starts to run wild with headlocks. He headlock takeovers him, and Paul fights out. So then he takes him over with another headlock, and Paul fights out. So then he does a standing headlock, 
but Paul shoots him off the ropes. And uh, Rowell hit him with a shoulder tackle. When Paul gets back up, time for another headlock takeover. He seriously did about like six or seven just headlock takeovers. It never ended. My next note is more headlocks. Paul rakes the eyes to try to get out. And he starts throwing some punches. And he does a standing axe handle to Ron's shoulder. He punches Ron. And Ron punches back. Ron eventually throws Paul into the ropes, catches him with the claw, and gets the win. Man, if that promo by Ron Bass got me excited to see his match, this match by Ron Bass did not get me got me less excited because the promo was fun. But now I actually have to watch him wrestle again after he did about six or seven headlocks. And eh, not a not very good there, Mr. Ron Bass. Tony Schiavone's with Ric Flair. He called David Crockett a cheerleader, said he needs both of them to interview him. He's not like every Tom, Dick, or Harry. He's a world champ. He deserves more than one interviewer. He's Ric Flair. They cut the clips of the horseman taking out Dusty's knee. He said he and the Andersons are his three best wrestlers in the world. And David Crockett actually says, no, no, you're not. Uh... He says that every fat, pot-bellied man like Dusty Rose who watches the show hates Ric Flair because his wife sees what a real man's supposed to look like. He said that the Road Warriors are back from the AWA, that dying promotion. They're back in the big leagues. He said the AWA, the Road Warriors, and Ric Fl- and Dusty Rose are not what's happening in wrestling. A good promo by Ric. And yes, I do know what's going on with Ric Flair in the whole Dark Side of the Ring. And yes, I do think there should be some repercussions, but it's I, I'm going to just try to, as it's going on, avoid it. Because trying to do a NWA Jim Crockett review and not mention Ric Flair would be impossible. It's like how when you do reviews and there's a Benoit match, you just try to talk about the, the match you're watching. Starkid 85 update. Uh, David Crockett says Starkid 85, the greatest wrestling ever. The greatest gathering. The greatest fans ever. The greatest gathering. And then he paused for a second. They announced the same matches that were announced last week, but also announced for the vacant mid-Atlantic heavyweight title, Sam Houston versus Crusher Khrushchev. They made a good point that every match on the card has a purpose. Even if it's stupid, like for Manny Sombrero, every match on the card has a feud behind it. And WWE pay-per-views, these guys can learn from that. Uh, They announced... Uh, run down for Starkid and announced Barbarian versus Superstar Billy Graham in a match with a $10,000 arm wrestling challenge before the match. We go to George South versus a Barbarian with Paul Jones. Fans chant Paula at Paul. You know, got him there. The Barbarian has a cast over his right arm. And at first, he does nothing with it. He throws a clothesline with his left arm. He holds him up and does a backbreaker with his left arm. And then he starts using his cast for moves. David Crockett goes, he's favoring his right hand. And I thought, no, he's not. How's he even moving his right hand with a cast? He's doing perfectly fine. Barbarian with a shoulder tackle. And and a not great drop kick, but not horrible for a man Barbarian's size. Uh, Paul Jones punches George South while the ref's distracted. Barbarian gets uh, hits a power slam and a diving headbutt, a very safe diving headbutt. They saw a slow motion, in, and you can see Barbarian not even touch him with his head. So Barbarian, a very good worker, kept uh, Mr. South very safe. It was a, your average big man squash match. It wasn't anything spectacular, but not anything horrible. The only real weird to bad thing was Barbarian all of a sudden using his arm in a cast for moves. Uh, the... Up next is a championship challenge series as Ric Flair, Ole Anderson, and Arn Anderson take on Terry Taylor, Pez Watson, and Ronnie Garvin. And god damn, I know I'm only two weeks into this, but fuck, this was awesome. I think you could take this exact six-man tag, this exact structure, obviously not these exact six people, but you take like the Bucks and Kenny against Jurassic Express, or you take the New Day against the Hurt Business. And if they do this exact sequence of moves, this would be a very well-received match on Raw or SmackDown or AEW or NXT or anywhere today because this match 
was fucking awesome. If the last match seeing the Barbarian use his broken arm made you believe that wrestling wasn't real, then this match did a very good job of making you believe this is a fight. So, it started off, uh, Pez out-wrestles both Andersons, knocks Ole out, knocks Arn out, and he backs off Ric Flair. The crowd's getting fucking hyped. If you remember last week, I said I liked Pez Watson. I want to see more of him. I'm glad he's on tonight. Pez hits two drop salts to Arn Anderson, the drop kick where, yes, in fact, he does do a backflip and land on his stomach. Uh, Ronnie and Ric Flair. Ronnie Garvin and Ric Flair get tagged into the ring. And fuck, the exchanges between those two men. The strikes that are throwing. When I said this match makes you feel like this is a fight, this is what I'm talking about. The strike exchange between Ronnie and Ric was insane. They were throwing chops. They were throwing punches. These punches looked like they were really connecting. They looked like they were hurting like hell. At one point, Rick has Ronnie backed into the corner, and Ronnie does a standing, jumping headbutt to Ric Flair. Flair takes a huge back body drop, as he is one to do. This entire time, they're just like quick tags from the horsemen, uh, and from the good guys at first. Flair throws Pez into Arn's knee. Pez did get tagged back in and ran wild for a bit. But he got thrown to Arn's knee to take advantage. Arn stomps Pez. He throws as uh, Pez tries to get back in the ring. Terry Taylor, eventually the match breaks down into like a big, uh, everyone in there brawling. Taylor, Ronnie, and Pez beat up all of the horsemen. Well, mainly Ronnie and Taylor because so much is happening that Pez is just looking around the ring for somebody to fight. But Taylor and Ronnie already beat up all the other guys. Ronnie, he does his jumping, standing headbutt again. Ric Flair distracts the ref as he Anderson's double team, Ronnie Garvin. Anderson was a beautiful punches to Ronnie, and Ric Flair followed by beautiful punches. They're not working over Ronnie. I know I'm skipping through this match, but there are times where they're working over Ronnie, they work over Pez, they work over Terry. Uh, these are just the biggest moments of this match. This match is, yeah, this match is doing a great job making it seem like this is just a chaotic fight between six men. Ric Flair and Ronnie Garvin do another strike exchange that's just as brutal as a first, and they do a double down when they collide the heads. Ric Flair is the first to get back up, but instead of making a tag to the Andersons, he goes to the top rope for, of course, a Flair throw. Terry Taylor hits a hot tag and he punches the Andersons. Uh, Arn took over and Terry missed a drop kick. Quick tags to the horsemen to keep Terry isolated. Flair was a very safe body slam to Terry on the outside, which is exposed concrete, so that was nice. Terry fights back, and he actually gets a figure four on the Rick, but only breaks it up. Eventually, he's able to get the tag to Pez. Pez takes on all three men, and then all six men get back into the ring. Rick is thrown to the outside. Pez is thrown to the ropes. But Flair trips him. Arn hits an axe handle to the back of Pez. And as he pins him, Flair holds Pez's feet down so that the Andersons and Flair win. And that was an awesome match. I went through it pretty quickly. I went through all the spots quickly. But that match, like I said, I think it would be fit right in with... If, it seemed like a fight. It did not seem like choreographed spots. It just seemed like a chaotic, like these six men were all trying to win a fight. And that match was fucking awesome. The best match I've seen of either of the shows for the past two weeks. Which isn't really saying much, to be honest. Uh, but great job by all of them. I, I I do know Pez Watson doesn't have a better career. And I am kind of sad about that because I've been impressed with Pez the past two weeks. We go to the uh, podium where Tony Schiavone's was Baby Doll and Tony Blanchard. He said in the record book that cheating doesn't matter. It's going to say that Flair and the Andersons won. He said, there's no more Mr. Nice Tolly. He said, in the, no, he didn't say that. He said, no more, Mr. Tolly, no more. That's what Magnum TA is going to say in the I Quit match. This is the last one. I quit. He's going to let Baby Doll slap Magnum for in the face for indecency of forcing himself upon her, which, you know, he sh she should do. He did do that. He said his motorcycle has rust on it, which actually got Baby Doll to laugh. He said he went to Magnum's gym, and they gave Tully a Magnum secret. It was a promo. There have been much better Tully promos. It seemed like he didn't really know where he's, not really know where he's going. But it seemed like he just sort of jumped around a lot, talking about, like, 
die quit match, and then his motorcycle, and then his gym. Not a horrible promo, but just seemed a little, like, lost for point. Jim Crockett announced Mandy Fernandez versus Buddy Landell last week in the one not jobber versus star match. Actually, two stars fighting. Dusty Rhodes came out, and he said, I've been thinking about Ric Flair, night and day, day and night. It's all about Ric Flair. He's got, I got Ric Flair's number and his color. And his color is yellow. He's got a yellow streak that goes down his back and all the way to his cousin's back. He says, Rick, I want you to pretend that Dusty won't be a Starcade. I want you to pretend that Dusty isn't going to kick your booty, take your money, and break your leg, and send you home to your mama because you couldn't make it, because you don't get enough money to make it two weeks on your own. And you know what? I mean, if any point is going to be made against Ric Flair, it's that he's not good with his money. A good promo by Dusty, as usual. Uh... That's my Dusty impression for all of you probably suck, but, you know, a good promo by Dusty. Mac and Jim Jeffers versus the Road Warriors. The Road Warriors jump up before the bell. They do a double shoulder tackle spot, spot to knock him out of the ring. What an animal he is. Ho-ho, says David Crockett. Hawk throws one of the Jeffers and brings in the other and hits a big boot. Animal was a gorilla press. Hawk was a big clothesline. Animal hits a big clothesline on his own for the win. It was a Road Warrior squash, which means it was fun watching these two big men beat up these not as big men. But, you know, like the Barbarian match, nothing special, but fun. One of the most fun things about these is just hearing what David Crockett will say. I honestly think I watch this show mainly for the promos. Ole Ander the Andersons and Ric Flair are speaking about that with, the with Tony Schiavone. Ole said Dusty and Road Warriors got something cooking. They're working together. What the fuck did I write? Oh, he's a Dusty come out here with their 50 cent looking jacket, looking like a farmer, talk, talking tough, and the horsemen aren't out, aren't out there. Arndt said, Dusty, you better step up to get this title and not just ask for it back. You better be a man for once in your life. Rick said, in a showroom, a Mercedes and a Benz, they look real good if you're a car. But you look even better if you're standing with the with Ric Flair and the Andersons. All right, Edith Flair. Uh, Arn and Ole are really good promos. Flair, a great promo himself, but that one, that wasn't his best. But it was still good. Saying a Ric Flair promo isn't his best is still like nine, better than 90% of uh, promos. Tully Blanchard was Baby Doll versus the scrawny ginger that we never got his name of. Tully throws a guy to the outside and Baby Doll slaps him in from the ref. Tully works a leg for a little bit before hitting a, shings, a slingshot suplex to win. That was a match. I like Tully Blanchard, but I really liked his promo and his performance better last week. This was this hour. Meh. The Road Warriors are with Tony Schiavone. Hawk says Paul is in. Paul is doing his Ebenezer Scrooge routine, counting their money back home. He has no respect for Ric Flair anymore. He used to, but not anymore. He said, these they're not friends with Dusty, but they're working with Dusty because Dusty is a man from the streets, just like them. Animal said, Dusty and LOD knew what it was like to grow up on the streets, what the streets are about. Asked where Nakia was for two years if he's so big and tough and strong where they were national champions. Hawk said he's got a new name for the Russians. The Baldies! And my ECW review will be coming up next. Speaking of the Baldies. It was, a, it was a good promo, you know. There's not a lot of times I'll say there's a bad promo on this show. Just because I really like these unscripted promos better. Even if they're not great. Like like I said, Nikita wasn't great. And he probably would get outdone by a scripted Raw promo. But even the not great unscripted promos that come off the top of their head... Usually are better. And the Road Warriors had a good promo here tonight. They called out the Russians. They called out Flair and the Andersons. Said Dusty's from the streets. It all works well. Joe Malcolm versus Magnum TA. Magnum hit a drop kick. And I was like, oh shit, he's doing more than last week. And then he hit his belly to belly to win. So hitting two moves is in fact doing more than last week. We only hit one. So, you know, good for you, Magnum. David Crockett called him America's heartthrob. Uh, they showed a replay where David breaks down the step-by-step -step to the belly-to-belly, -belly, including the squatting, the positioning, the getting ready for the man. Magnum was Tony Schiavone. 
Maynard says, there's no secret to an I quit match. Only one man wants it more. Only one man has more heart. He said, Tully will be the man to say I quit. He's going to prove who the rightful U.S. champion is. And that secret that he learned at the gym don't mean jack shit. He knows that part, but basically. It was a promo. Uh, you know. It was fine. It wasn't the worst on the show. It wasn't the best on the show. The Paul, Paul Jones is there with the Barbarian, or as Paul said, the, the Ball Baron. The Ball Baron is just as strong in his left hand as he is his right, which is great news for him, but bad news for Billy Graham. He says Billy will not be around to see who the world champion is at the end of the night. It seemed like Paul Jones didn't really know where he was finishing that promo. I don't know how to fuck you look at the name Barbarian and pronounce it Ball Baron. I don't know where the L came from, but you, you do you, Paul Jones. We are promo. Not a great promo, but a promo. Adrian Bivens and Rocky King versus the tag team champions Nikita Koloff and Ivan Koloff. And this is a match where I said, it looked like a guy that you would see in Ring of Honor, like 2005. Rocky King, he's not very big. But he has no body fat. He's got abs. He's got arms. Like, he just looks like a current day wrestler. And that uh, all of these old jobbers, and even the stars, they look like old fucking men back then. And even his partner, Adrian Bivens, looked like an old fucking dad they just picked out of the same fucking grill, grill out that the other guy was at. I think Paul Garner that I said. Um, Rocky, it's a drop kick. But then he stands still because he had no idea what to do next. He runs at Ivan and just hugs him. Ivan had enough. Beats his ass. Tags in Nikita. Nikita hits a big gut wrench to Rocky. He's uh, Rocky's able to tag out to get Adrian back in, but I think Ivan had enough of him blowing that first spot because I don't think Rocky ever got back into the ring. Bivin hits some chops, but Nikita forearms him down. They make quick tags. Ivan hits a leg drop, a weird leg drop. Like he runs. It's like just sort. It looks like he slips. Like. How a cartoon would slip out on a banana peel. That's how he does his leg drop. Um, Nikita body slams Adrian, which was pretty impressive because Adrian's a big guy. If he was in any better shape or maybe any better of a wrestler, he probably would have been a star. He's a big guy, especially in that era. Ivan does a shoulder tackle to the ribs, which was kind of odd. And at first I said it was a fuck up, but then he does it a second time. We were like, I don't even know if he's going for a shoulder tackle. He's throwing his shoulder, but he's like hitting him in the ribs and the back. It's really weird by Ivan. At first, I thought it was because he was so much shorter than Adrian, but he did it two times in a row. Um, Ivan steps on Adrian's face as the ref's distracted. They had a Russian sickle. Well, Nikita, it's a Russian sickle on Adrian to win. After the match, the ref raises their arms, and Nikita elbow drops Adrian twice. It was not a good match, you know. I think that Rocky, he never really got a chance to redeem himself after fucking up that first spot. And then all they did was just beat up Adrian for about four minutes. And it was it just what it was there, you know. Ivan does weird-ass shoulder tackles. That's all I got to say about that. For not the first, not the second, but the third time, Ric Flair is back with Tony Schiavone. Only this time he's in a suit now. He says one moment. He's the greatest athlete alive. The next, he's a refined business executive. He said you hang out with the elite in pro wrestling, which he may have been doing until this whole thing popped out. Oli in the art and Tolly walked up. Oli said everyone looks at the horsemen for their inspiration. It's hard to be modest when you're so great. Flair says the girls know how to, how refined Oli can be, which is... Quite something to think about. Dusty and Magnum are in the ring, and they start jawjacking. The horsemen walk up there, and they're walking slowly, but all four of them walk up, and they get on the apron, and they look like they're about to fight four on two. But the road warriors run in, and <laughs> one, the crowd goes insane, too. It's so hyped that Hawk trips on the middle rope getting in and rolls, and then stands up. On a fair fight... The horsemen back down. Arn is screaming that this was a setup and it wasn't fair, despite the fact what makes that great is that it was fair because now it was four on four. When it was two on four, there was no complaints from Arn. But now in a fair fight, it's somehow not fair. The show goes off the air with the four, with the eight men staring each other down. 
that was a good, fun way to end the show. You had eight of your biggest stars out there. You had another flair in Anderson's promo, which is always good. You had the hypocrisy of Arn Anderson, which is good for a heel to do. You had Hawk tripping on the rope. Overall, huh. Overall, I feel like this show was just about no. The only thing that made this show better than last week was uh was that six man tag. I think that six man tag was awesome, and you should go back and watch it. But I feel like some of the promos fell off. Like I enjoyed Tolly's promo and match more last week. The Andersons didn't cut bad promos, but I feel like I liked their promos more last week. Jimmy Valiant's always a fucking highlight. I won't ever say anything bad about him. So overall, this show just about evened out, except the only thing that gave this one a slight edge over last week was that fucking awesome six-man tag, which you can go watch. It is episode uh, 46, November 16th, 1985. Just watch that six-man tag. It's worth it. Which brings us to ECW Hardcore TV, episode 2 from April 13th, 1993. Now, if you remember, last week ended with Terry Funk going... Thanks for watching. We'll get better. Please don't leave us. Did they get better? We'll find out. Stevie Wonderful out welcomes us, and he welcomes a king of the death match to the announced team, Eddie Gilbert. Eddie Gilbert comes out, but Jay Scully stops him and says it's Terry Funk. Eddie yells at Funk, and Terry Funk pokes Eddie in the chest, saying, if you want to do this now, we can do this. He pulled uh, Eddie's shirt open, and poured water down it. Eddie screamed and walked off. That was how the show opened, and that was a pretty uh, nothing going opening. I, I mean, somehow Terry Funk pouring water down somebody's shirt wasn't as entertaining as it sounds. <coughs> the first match was another TV title round one match as Johnny Hotbody takes on Glenn Osborne. 300 pounds counting as eagle. Johnny Hotbody, said the announcer. Johnny yells at the crowd. The crowd yells back, hot body sucks. Osborne shouted, yeah, and threw his fist up. About eight of the 200 people said, yeah. Osborne runs wild with headlock takeovers. I just realized that two fucking people in these reviews ran wild with headlock takeovers. Four in a row. I didn't count fucking Ron Bass's, but apparently Johnny Hotbody did four. Pretty sure Ron did more than them. To be fair to Rondo, his headlocks looked a lot better than Glenn's. But Jesus Christ. Johnny uses uh, Glenn's singlet to throw him into the turnbuckle. And I think that actually ripped his singlet because it like tipped, like the straps just ripped apart. Uh, I think Johnny went for a sleeper, but Glenn thought it was going to be a clothesline and went down. And Johnny immediately went for a sleeper after. And, uh... That's why I also think that he's out that he was supposed to be a sleeper, because the next thing he did was a sleeper. And it was a pretty stiff looking clothesline, like not how you would take a clothesline. It looks like he was trying to wrap his arm around and then Glenn just went down. A nice German suplex by Johnny, the best move in the past two weeks of ECW. In all honesty, out of ECW so far, I'm not counting WCW over there, but Johnny Hotbody is probably the best out of the guys in the past two weeks of ECW. No offense there, Jimmy Snuka, but you're a little past him. If it was prime Jimmy Snuka, maybe. But Johnny Hotbody so far is the MVP of the past two weeks. Uh, and uh, he suplexes John or Glenn onto the concrete floor and has a running form off the apron. Johnny accidentally clotheslines the ref and hits a low blow. And a jumping pile driver to Glenn. When Tommy K K.O., I forgot about his name, K.O., talked about him last week. He came into the ring. He knocked Hot Body off the top rope. Glenn Osborne hit a frog splash to win. Sucks. Johnny's been the most improved in two, or most impressive in two weeks, I wrote my notes. And I fucking agree with me. Johnny has been. Glenn Osborne isn't really uh, good. He looks... Generic, like he's just trying to be a metal rock band guy, and I, I the wrong man won here. But you got to build your rivalry, I guess, so yay, Glenn. Terry Funk interviews Glenn. He cuts a generic promo saying the title is going where it belongs. Hot Body was a first victim, all going down. Yeah. Glenn Osborne was nothing. Ignore him. He sucks. Johnny Hot Body 
wasn't spectacular, but in terms of ECW 1993, he's the fucking man so far. So let's go, Johnny. <clears throat> Up next, the number one contenders for the tag titles, Larry Winters and Tony Stenson takes on the Simone Warrior and Chris Michaels. And both Tony and Chris uh, lost in TV title round one matches last week. There's New York Suck Chance from the crowd. Ugly Knee by Chris to Larry. Uh, he threw it a sharp, the sharp part of his knee into his gut. Larry Winters actually isn't bad, is what I noticed from this match. He actually is pretty passable. Sucks who his tag partner is, though, because I, I, ooh, forget to Tony. Larry punch, ooh, here we go, getting right to Tony right now. So they go for a tag move, which was, they throw the guy in the ropes, Larry punches him in the gut, and Tony runs the ropes and hits a swinging neck breaker. Sounds pretty fucking simple for a tag move. Tony fucking Stenson. Fuck this swinging neck breaker up in a way I've never seen before. He, like, just barely got his arm around the guy's neck, just enough so the guy knew to start spinning, and then he completely lost con contact. The one guy, I think it was Chris. Yeah, it had to be Chris. Uh, he goes flying in one direction. Tony goes flying in the other direction, just completely up in the air. They both come down. I've never seen anybody fuck up a swinging neck breaker so bad. I don't know how you can. Tony fucking sucks. Tony out trips Chris. Chris skins the cat for absolutely no reason. Like, there's no reason to do it. And Tony does a cactus jack clothing over the top. My next notes were Tony fucking sucks. Larry with a double neck breaker. A Dolph neck breaker. The Dolph, as Michael Cole used to say in the video games. <sighs> Tony, eventually the Samoan warrior gets in. He's a big, fat Samoan guy. Terry Funk was really excited to see him. Tony tries to hit a face buster to the warrior, but he never targeted Samoan's head. But then warrior takes a pulse, and he takes an impressive back roll and bump to sell. That was probably the most impressive thing of this match, was how athletic the big Samoan warrior was there at that moment. Larry was a side body drop to warrior. Uh... They do the headbangers finish to Chris, where one guy holds the other guy by the legs, and then the other guy comes up with the top rope with a leg drop. But Chris was not the legal man. So, you know, fuck. They fucked him over. Like I said, it was it was a bad match. It was not fine, but not horrible when Larry Winters, Larry Winters was in there. But whenever Tony Stenson got in, fuck, he sucked. Funk interviewed them. He said, moving on up, moving on up from the east side, or whatever they say. Uh, the Super Destroyer's manager came out with one belt. I don't know where the other tag belt is. He called Larry and Tony Bart and Homer Simpson. These were fighting words, because Tony and Larry grabbed him by the shirt collar. The, the Super Destroyers ran out, and they brought his Tony and Larry into the back. Their manager tried to help, but Terry Funk held on to his shirt collar and just got dragged along with it the entire time. <clears throat> For the ECW Championship, the Sandman. Now, when I say ECW Champion Sandman, it's not what you're picturing in your head. He's the other half of this thumbnail. Just look at that and then realize this isn't the Sandman that you know and love. Taking on Kodiak Bear. From the tundras of Alaska to Kodiak Bear, I'm sorry. Terry Funk deliberately lied to our face and said, one of the greatest athletes in the world today, the Sandman. Sandman comes out in his multicolored surfer suit. Half of the front is like purple, half the front is like tannish orange. He's got two <coughs> green wristbands on, neon green like shoulder pads, I don't know, like the shoulder parts of his swimsuit. He's got the two color shade sunglasses. He's got the uh He's got the neck ribbon, not neck ribbon. He's got the thing on his neck and it's also neon green like his armbands, neck bands what I meant to say. Uh the back of it is green and bright purple. I appreciate what you've done in the past with kids, says Terry Funk to Sandman. No other explanation of what the fuck he's talking about. I don't want to know what he's talking about with that sentence. But I don't want to know what that what the Sandman is doing with kids. And Terry Funk appreciates it. 
There's 16 minutes left, I thought, singing. This is going to be horrible. Apparently... This wasn't the main event, but they called it the main event for his world title, and I thought they left 16 minutes of Sandman match. The Florida match pieces kisses a Sandman, and at first Sandman tries to avoid it, pulls his head back, and then goes through with it. Kodak Bear yells at the crowd, and Sandman taps that ass. Kodiak has, pa has plain black pants and a shirt, one red elbow pad, but on his fat ass, it says... Kodiak. Kodiak was just a big fat guy. He's very hairy and he also has long hair but a bald spot on top of his head. These are most of my notes about the match. Oh, this match was fucking nothing. Kodiak was a thumb to the throat. He chokes Sandman and rakes his eyes twice. A cheating bear. Sandman hits a top rope missile dropkick. Now, if you've ever seen a Sandman leg drop, it seems physically impossible for a man to lift both of his legs at once. Like, one leg comes up first, and then the other one follows. That's how he throws a drop kick from the top rope. He doesn't jump off with both feet coming at the guy. One foot leads, and the other foot follows. Uh, he does a slingshot tackle from the apron. I didn't know if it was supposed to be a crossbody, but he just sort of bumped into the guy. He hits the Million Dollar Dream and retained... Uh, Funk starts singing some Sandman, Sandman, give me a dream. <coughs> it was a bad match for the world championship. That sucks. But Sandman looked ridiculous and Terry Funk sang. So I can't give it a complete thumbs down. The last match in round one for the ECW TV title tournament. Eddie Gilbert takes on J.T. Smith. Stevie told Funk to shut up and immediately regretted it as Funk yelled at him and said, Say it to my face, boy. Eddie throws JT into the gym door, picked up a ring bell. Funk stood up. JT, they start falling, fighting to the outside. Like, and they fight into the crowd. They fight into, like, the high school gym doors. Eddie hit him with a chair. Then threw him into the gym door. JT starts to fight back with punches and an ugly clothesline but a very nice fallaway slam from one JT. He misses a huge moonsault where he gets so much air, and I'm pretty sure that if Eddie Gilbert didn't move, that JT wouldn't have hit him anyway. Uh, they fight to the outside. Well, uh, Eddie is on the outside, and they do the spot where Eddie gets, like, brass knuckles on his hand, and JT goes for the belly to back suplex, picks him up, but Eddie hits him with the brass knucks, falls on top of JT to win. Jake Scully snitches, but the ref don't do shit about it because Jay Scully a snitch. Um, it was a match. It felt like the most ECW match out of any of these matches so far with all the brawling in the crowd and random chair shots. But it wasn't great. It wasn't horrible. Was it the best match on the card? No, actually, because Johnny Hotbody. But it was it was passable, which is more than what I can say for half of the ECW stuff so far. Tommy Cairo, in your main event, Tommy Cairo uh, takes on Super Ninja. The match is joined in progress. Uh, there's a lazy lockup. That seems to be a common theme in ECW so far. So many guys just doing lazy-ass lockups. Uh, the Ninja does three, no, does a throat chop. And that's three throat chops and three matches in a row to take the heat. Uh, Tommy ends up fighting back with a beauty shot. Every eye rake and every eye rake and kick the ninja does is described as a martial arts kick, and every eye rake they call a ninja eye rake. Tommy pinned the ninja. I didn't even write how. I have no idea how. Right as Hot Body attacked, they brawled to the curtain. Taefunk wishes us goodbye, and he wasn't sure who was in round two of the tournament. He had to think about it. And uh, that main event, it, I mean, it was joined in progress. I don't know how much we missed of it. It was pretty basic. Basically, Ninja's only moves were doing, like, ninja kicks, which are just kicks to the chest and eye rakes. Tommy Cairo did some moves, like a uh, beauty shot. I honestly think at this point I was just waiting for this episode to end. This episode dragged. Did it get better, like Terry Funk said? Not really. I mean... Hot Body was good, but he was on the first episode, too. So far, ECW's, it's, it's hard to get through. These are only, like, 40-minute episodes, but fuck. 
these are not easy to get through. Johnny Hotbody, the Sandman in his wetsuit, and Terry Funk singing. The only highlights of this show. ECW sucked. Jim Crockett Promotions was probably an average Jim Crockett promotion, so it was a fucking awesome six-man tag. And that's the end of this review. Thanks for watching.